So I wanted to say the obvious, which is not obvious. Life is not what it seems. We think that this podium is solid. We think that our identity is such and such. We think that this electrical sheen of images, of people, and places, this is real. But science doesn't agree. Science says you're made up of these atoms. The atoms, if you had a nucleus that was as big as a basketball, the electron would be two miles away. And so, what's going on? In all of this world, it's empty space. Empty space. So, we think it's all solid, but it's not. It's empty space. And what is that in that empty space? As Swami said to Shulman, Bhavadul, he said, uh, Shulman was having a hard time understanding what the heck was going on with Swami. He went there in 1969 and Swami was away and people were trying to explain Swami to him and he was confused. And then Swami came back and Swami gave him. And Shulman said he was confused. And uh, Swami, in his sort of Zen style, sometimes Swami is very Zen, and you can't really fully understand it. Sometimes he'll be there, just he'll be the spaced out Swami, and he's just there, and it's just a, a thusness or an isness to it. It's just unlike this regular life, it's just sort of like watching TV. It's just like one thing happens another, and here's what we expect, and we sort of double plot, and blah, blah, blah. But when you're with Swami, Suddenly, the TV is off, and this is real. This is whatever he says is real. Whatever he does is real. And whatever your relationship to him is real. And so with Shulman, he said to him, within appearance is nothingness. Within nothingness is everything. Shulman's like, oh, wow. You know, <laughs> what am I going to do with that? And, uh, but it was... I think his devotees were sort of ready to consider this. So the idea is that nothing is nothing. You think of nothingness as like, hey, that's that's bad stuff. That's dirt. That's like nothing. No, that's like nothing. It's a judgment. No, nothing is nothing. But nothingness is God. God permeates everything. And within that, you know, the uh, they talk about the five elements, uh, the element of ether. So the element of ether in the Hindu uh, cosmology permeates atoms and everything, and there's an ether. And science is starting to catch up with that in the sense that this nothingness also has certain physical powers to it. We can't detect it, but it seems to influence things around it. And uh, so it's just one of those beautiful things about uh, things. And there, there are aspects in this life which give little hints of divine perfection. Let me tell you one I just heard, and I wonder, how, let me know at the end how many of you have heard this before, because I found it kind of stunning and it's super obvious at the same time. The distance of the sun to the earth is 108 diameters of the sun. I knew this, okay. The, Distance of the moon to the earth is, is 108 diameters of the moon. And let's see, there's something else too about the earth that's 108 too. There's a third one there. It'll come to me. Now, how many of you have heard this before? Yeah. Okay, three, four. Okay, still worth telling. So there is this perfection. So with this perfection, what do we do? What do we to do with this life that uh, Swami has given us? We don't appreciate it. We do what Swami calls getting and forgetting. And unfortunately, this even applies to Swami. We get Swami in some form or other. We can't capture him fully, but we have some aspect of Swami that we think, you know, we've got him or we understand him or we have a connection to him. But then someday comes by and you, you know, you forget and uh, you think, well, did that really happen? Was that really something? I was sitting there once on the veranda and Swami had ignored me for, you know, a number of years. And one day as he was going down the 
backslide in his wheelchair. There was just a little opening where behind the uh, where the driveway is on the veranda, a little opening and you can look out. And there's just room for two people to look out there. And as Swami is being wheeled down, he's looking straight at me the whole time. It was so intense. I thought, did I imagine that? Just did I make that up? Fortunately, the fellow next to me said, Wow, so I look how Swami looked at you. And I remember that and keep that. But uh, got all the love track there. So we can, as I said, we can take anything in this world for granted, including Swami. So how do we stick with it? So for instance, Churchill, there's a famous quote about Churchill. And it's about our fellow humans. And I think we're well aware of how this works. It said, humans often stumble on the truth, but most of them pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and move away. You know, they just keep going. And uh, you can see that sometimes people, uh, you know, like they have this moment. They don't have any structure or context in which to put it. It's sort of like, what was that about? You know, what was that? Fortunately for us, we have an idea of what that was about. And these are moments that we should cherish and keep in mind and write down and make part of us. When it is that we have those moments, when we feel Swami, when Swami in some way, it doesn't have to be some dramatic thing, some small thing. Don't let it go. This is divine grace. You know, the micro version. You know, it's not like you're being shown the, uh, the forms of Vishnu or whatever. But we each have these small little bits of grace. And this is what keeps us alive. Because this is where the real energy, the divine energy comes in. Most people aren't aware as, as to what those moments are, but they, they have them, but they just don't have any context for them. So... <laughs> Someone was once saying that you're taking Swami for granted until you see the sun and the moon in his eyes. Because Swami's everywhere and he's omnipresent and he's before us. And the sun is a good, good version of this. Because the sun is the ultimate giver of the kingdom. I mean, Swami is the ultimate giver. But as for the visible world, the sun is the ultimate giver. It's this fire that gives us life. It's on 24 hours a day. Fortunately, for our benefit, it, it dims out for parts of our time so we can sleep. But th this giving, this giving every moment, every moment radiates this earth and gives all the energy and life to this earth. But we can't even look at it. First of all, we take it for granted. Second, we can't even really look at it straight on. Th that giving is too much for us. We just sort of, it's like, oh yeah, okay. We don't even tune into it. So it's an aspect of God. It's an aspect of God for us at every moment. So what should we do in this face of this divine perfection? So in this divine perfection, how do we get ourselves free? Or freer? How do we fully appreciate Swami? How do we do it? Well, I'm here to tell you. <laughs> no, I won't give you any laws. Because... We're each God. Swami has told us we're God. We've incarnated as beings that are able to, in some form, discern or find out that they're God. That we have some hide and seek mechanism within us in which we can find ourselves, find God, and find ourselves with God, and find ourselves as God. This is. Uh, this is quite a thing. And so when the young Westerners first came, there was a big interest in, in meditation. And the idea was that if you meditated enough, you would become unified with God. And all the gurus that had come to the U.S. would be, I'll give you this mantra, or I'll give you this whack on the head, or I'll give you this teaching, and you do this meditation, and you do it so many for so long, and then you become free. You know, it's just sort of a formula. And uh, I sort of re reduced that formula. I mean, I'm a son of a mathematician. And uh, the formula that enca encapsulates this type of thinking is E 
for enlightenment equals M for meditation divided by K for karma. So, it's very simple. You know, you meditate and uh, so many hours, and depending on how bad your karma was, uh, you could get through this course in a fairly good time. And uh, the Swami was never like that. Never like that. As a matter of fact, he used to make jokes about our meditation and stuff, and they think you're meditating and you're worried about when the dopey is coming. And then, of course, he would give the special privilege that we could always go into the meditations in the morning and the evening. But you get in there and the, uh, they would pack you so tight and it sort of provoked all of your thoughts about boundaries and who am I and how dare you and so stuff like that. It's wonderful. And so they pack in so tight. You're like this. And, uh, and also the fellow in the morning was great because he was always on the lookout for anyone that might talk. So you're in a dark hall. You're in a hall about this size, size the Mandir. And it's packed with at least twice, you know, maybe three times as many people. And it's pitch black. And so if anyone should ever give a little cough, <laughs> he said, who did that? Who did that? So it's like he get up and he'd have the torch. He's, you know, the, the light beam is going out. And he'd be looking at people. Did you, were you the one that coughed? You know, and stuff like that. And of course, he could, no one would ever confess. And uh, so you never catch the coffer. And finally, then... This whole wild light show would end, and then finally he'd sort of go back to his corner. Then the next you'd hear a little, oh, who did that? <laughs> so that was that was the kind of meditations we had there. Fortunately, Swami sort of put us out of our misery later. In uh, the early 2000s, he was speaking, I believe, to the young adults. We were there, and uh, uh, he said that uh, it was making fun of the meditations and stuff like that. And he said, he encouraged meditation, but at the same time, you had to realize that you really weren't doing that much in meditation. He said, really, if you do a meditation for 11 seconds and you're totally focused and concentrated, and Dr. Reddy mentions this probably, in our, I, I mentioned this too, because it's, it's just so spectacular. First of all, it gives you the hope, if I were to do something like that, I could get the big prize. I could be the, I could, you know, like you get in the US, you get these things. It says you may already be a grand winner in the mail. So, but uh, it sort of counteracts our usual thing, which is, well, I'm going to meditate, but I don't really have time, or I don't, uh, you know, this isn't the right moment, or it's astrologically not correct, or whatever. Swami cuts right through that. He cuts to, you have 11 seconds, try and meditate. And I think it's a wonderful thing because in 11 seconds, you can give it your best shot. You give it your whole thing. Whereas you meditate for an hour, you know, you're drowsy, you're this, you're that, you're, you're often pango pango, whatever. But 11 seconds, and then if it fails, okay, I gave my shot. I can do another one tomorrow, another, another, as many as possible. So, Got a little off track. So, as God, we become God as we unfold to God. That means as we keep in contact with God, as we talk to God, as we converse with God, as we become boon friends with God. This is how we start this fire or keep this fire going that Swami has ignited. And how do we do it? We can choose. Do I go back to my consciousness now or do I stick with my boon friend? We, at every moment, we have this choice. So this friend is a friend that can be with you 24-7, all ages of your life. And the... Uh, one of the problems with marriage today is we put so much pressure on marriage in which when my spouse has to be my best friend. My spouse has to understand me completely. That's, a, that's impossible. And uh, my spouse has to hear my every thoughts or, and, or my spouse has to uh, redeem me in some way or my spouse has to you know, always be helpful. 
my spouse should never be uh, conditionally judging me in any way. And the list goes on. You can make up your own list for sure. Sure. <laughs> but if, there are no spouses like that. <laughs> you have spouses that they they have their own interests. And when you, it's you know it's uh, 5:42 a.m. and you have some thought you want to share, and they're not going to be interested. But you have this divine friend who will be interested, who will respond in some way, some thought like, is that for real or is that true? Or is that worth having that thought? And so you can judge all of your thoughts against that. Is having this thought, this request, this interaction with Swami, does this make sense? Am I proud of this interaction with Swami? If I want to be proud of my interactions with Swami, it changes the nature of what I say. And it, it doesn't have to be super profound. It could be, Swamiji, you're great. Or Swamiji, I love you. Or Swamiji, be here with me. Swamiji, be here with this person. Swamiji, solve this problem. Swamiji, this or that. So as someone previously was saying, in duality, we're asking. But in unity, you know, what happens? You can peel the, the layers of the onion, all those dualities, all those things that are on your mind. You know, you've got thousands of jumbling desires going on. You just turn them into Swami. Swami, 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 Swami. This is what's on my mind. The Swami, this or that. Eventually, your mind gets tired of the desires. And it just likes to bask in the, in the aura of its divine friend. And then later, the mind will think of something else. But um, so I highly recommend this to everyone. And being a psychologist, I, uh, I treat a lot of people and I give them lots of suggestions. And every once in a while, suggestion, I'll make a suggestion and I'll think, wow, that's really a great suggestion. I should, should try that sometime. <laughs> so this is a, a way of being on the podium. It's a way of sort of reminding ourselves, you know, here's what you're preaching. Let's see how you, you do it. And uh, one of the blessings speaking the devotees, I think, yes, yes, this is right. Yes, I feel that that divine energy and that divine satsang. So one of the other things that Swami had said was that people were often like, oh, they were trying to memorize the Gita or they uh, you know, wanted some uh, Gita from Swami and stuff like that, or there was something that they felt missing. And Swami said, if you ask, if you ask, God will sing you your own Gita. And so, in other words, each of us has a different, slightly different story. Yeah, very similar, but slightly different stories, slightly different backgrounds, slightly different interests, slightly different proclivities for this Sadhana versus that Sadhana. And so, if we ask, we're lucky you know, if we're diligent. We can hear that that Gita uh, from Swami. I had a dream once, and uh, at this that stage of my life, I had a slight interest in opera, and I thought, "Oh, opera, that's beautiful. Uh, let's let's get into it." And so I was into it, and uh, Swami came in a dream one night. You know how Swami, when he comes in dreams, he uses your interests, whatever it is. You know, your images, your interests, and he moves them and changes them or whatever. So in this, Swami came and he sang this opera to me. A gorgeous opera. Beautiful. And I woke up and I tried to remember what he sang. But all I could hear was just the faint words in the end. And in the words in the end, he was saying, singing, sing, two o'clock. Two o'clock. And I don't think that really corresponds to any one language, but I think it's a mashup of uh, Latin and French and Italian. It's basically, you are what? Tell me who you are. Tell me who you are. That's what he's singing. And uh, it was quite profound. And I had a corollary on the physical plane of that at one point, which uh, I was describing how Swami would look over the audience and he would respond to someone's 
a different situation, maybe occasionally their question or whatever. So in this speech, he was speaking in Telugu and there was no translation. There were very few Westerners there. And I had on a very long quartet and I had uh, a Japa Mala with me and the Japa Mala was under my quartet. You know, I, I had been heard that you weren't supposed to show it or whatever. So I was very careful about keeping on the quartet. And I was sitting at about the 10th row, very good, very good seats. And uh, I'm sitting there and because I can't understand the, con uh, the concepts being discussed and which are mind boggling and, and uh, sort of sometimes would throw me off. Plus the translator would get mangled and then Swami would speak faster and faster and the translation ended up hopeless. So I avoided that. I'm sitting there and I'm just doing mantra and I'm looking at Swami and I'm just feeling so blissful and I'm feeling, oh, what a good boy am I. Look at me here. I'm here with the Lord and I'm just, I'm just doing my sadhana and uh, everything is great. This couldn't be at all better. So then Swami, it's I'm about where that gentleman is there, here. And, uh, and uh, Swami suddenly looks, he looks at me. My telegram is not very good. Here's what I hear. It goes on and uh, I asked the fellow next to me, he said, what did he say? He said, you can do Japa all your life, but unless you inquire who you are, it will come to nothing. So brutal, just brutal. But uh, obviously balanced out by the, the beauty of Swami speaking. And uh, it's, I think of this as useful information for all of us. It doesn't mean don't do Japa. Japa is something that will keep our mind at bay, something which will develop our devotion, keep our heart pure, and uh, you know, it has all kinds of different positive effects. But in the end, it's not, it's not sufficient. If Swami says, you have to know who you are. We, to come into our God self, to be our God person, to be God, we have to be God. And uh, it's, it's something in which, it's not a formula, it's not like a machine. Swami would say to people, are you a computer or a composer? And the gist was, the computer is, you're just accumulating things. And so a computer, in a sense, would say, uh, I'm going to do uh, 10 million Gayatris, and therefore I should get, the machine should then get whatever. But a composer means I'm taking from this life, and I'm writing a new song. I'm singing my song. I'm singing my song to God. So God is singing to us, if we hear. And we should be singing to God. It can be something like a budget, you know, sort of like a starter, but it can, it doesn't even have to be melodious or whatever. It can just be, you know, my Lord, I'm singing to you. I'm in my heart, I'm singing. I'm feeling the vibration of my heart. It's like, uh, you know, some of the budgets would say it's like a vena, or it's like this, or it's like that. But it doesn't even have to be that stylized. It's just my song comes to you when I think of you. My song comes to you. And even as our motions or our hand motions, it's sort of like we're trying to take that energy. We're trying to become our God self. We're really with God at every moment. So before I get a little too out of line here, um, the big question the big question, as other people have, have uh, delved into, it. <clears throat> there's the God, there's the bliss, there's the being friend, and then there's the test that comes with it. The test is, is everything good for me? If everything is good for me, then I'm in unity. The whole world, everything that happens, I think Leonardo was saying, every place, every person, every time, every moment, that's the real unity. You're there. But if there are things that don't work for me, like that's too horrible, or that person is too bad, or this moment is too bad, then we're not unity in a way. We're waiting for things to get better. So we're not fully in our God moment. We're still sort of in our little self. 
we can be very high, but we're still waiting for the next thing. What's the next big thing? We've already had the next big thing. There is no next big thing. There's no need for a next big thing. So, uh, I, you all know the uh, mantra, the Pornamida Pornamida. And uh, I do a sort of a rough and ready translation, which is, this is good, that is good. When the good is taken from the good, only the good remains. This is divine, that is divine. When the divine is taken from the divine, only the divine remains. This is perfect, that is perfect. And the perfect is taken from the perfect, only the perfect. So, in this world of slings and arrows and outrageous fortune, and this, uh, Leonardo nicely predicted we're all going to die. And, uh, but it's worse than that. You know, I, I once had a, a devotee who was saying uh, he was worried about all these new age predictions, the bad stuff that's going to happen. I said, I heard it's going to be even worse than that. He said, millions will die. He said, worse than that. He said, yes, I heard we're all going to die. <laughs> but even beyond that, everything that we know in this world, everyone we love, everyone that's, everything that grew, everything that lived, all gone, gone, gone. Horrible. Just absolutely horrible. On the other hand, we're God. And it can't get any better. So we have a choice. We can go on the lower level, which is horrible, in which we mostly sort of ignore all that stuff until well, something really bad happens to us. We sort of try and cruise to like this, la la la, la la, not listening. And, or we can say, I'm here just temporarily. This is just a temporary phenomenon. I'm a temporary bubble on, on the ocean of love. And uh, I'm happy to be this bubble for as long as I, until I pop. And even then, better, better I pop. And uh, so, is that a time I should stop or should I keep going? I should stop. <laughs> You're having a rebellion in your hands. Uh, let's see. Okay, well, let me try a little more of this. Okay, I'll sort of bring you down a little bit with an advertisement. So the, I'm co-chair of the International Archive Committee. And what that is, is it's trying to encourage devotees all over the world to remember and record in whatever form, written, tape, or video, or whatever it is, record any interactions with Swami. But on an individual level, to record, as I was trying to say before, any moments of grace, anything that's, that should be remembered, anything that's, that's worthy of this lifetime. It should be recorded. It will be helpful for each of us when we do this because it brings us back to what was most important. And it will help family members. This is sort of like your legacy. It'll help the center members and may help even beyond that. And so Archive was happy to help uh, in any way the suggestions or uh, PowerPoints or presentations or whatever you might have. So I'm trying to encourage people to do that. And on a center level, uh, you know, the people that knew Swami on the physical level are starting to age out and uh, they leave behind gifts. In an ideal world, they leave behind letters from Swami. We have some in the U.S. house, uh, but they leave behind materialized objects or robes that Swami gave and stuff like that. And uh, these would be things that would be useful on a center level. They each have something like that that came physically from Swami. You're, you come physically to the center and here's the physical manifestation of Swami. So how you handle that, uh, I don't know, but I put that suggestion out there. And someone else had already talked about the histories of the organization. So many of the places around the world have done histories of their organization, and that's that's useful also. So let me end by saying, in U.S. business, they would often say, failure is not an option. And when, when you hear that in business, it means, watch out, someone's going to get fired. So it's sort of like, uh, it's a gentleman. 
But failure is not an option, applies to devotees. It means that all will be saved. That means that the devotees will be saved, the, everything out there will be saved. The Swami says, don't worry, have faith that all will be saved. This is uh, in the Dick Bach record from 1969 that I got when I first heard about Swami. Said, no, uh, said, I've come to drive evil back into the jungle. I thought, whoa, this is a lot different than what I was expecting. <laughs> Either this person's crazy or he's on to something much, much bigger. And uh, it said, all will be saved despite the crisis that's come upon humanity. And something we need to remember that Swami has given us this, this uh, injunction. So in this mystery and this ownership that we have as our God self, we don't own anything. Because we don't need to own We, I very much like the joke that says, I have the world's largest seashell collection. It's so large, I have to keep it spread over beaches all over the world. And I think that that's how we should approach this world. I have family all over the world, everywhere. And that we see everyone as children. I mean, the people we see around us, they could be older, they could be wiser, they were richer, they're, they're this, they're more athletic, but they're our children. It's part of our taking responsibility for Swami's world. And anything like that, uh, we should, should keep to it. Okay, so I said that we can't capture Swami. And I had one last story about that, in which... One time Swami would come in the sort of gloaming darshan. It was sort of after evening darshan. And uh, he was chewing out the fellow right next to me. You know, right next to me. And there's, there's Swami standing there and I'm sitting there and i am got his feet right there. And it had been a while since I've been able to touch his feet. And this is a perfect opportunity. I couldn't possibly miss. And he's going to be there. And I reach for his feet gently right there. And I miss. <laughs> but, how did that happen? And he started moving his feet, you know, sort of, no, not intense, but just moving his feet. Very, I thought, uh, okay, well, I'll be more careful this time. And I reach for him, I'm thinking, I've got him. I think this is what set Swami off. I thought, I got you now, you know, it's your mind. And uh, I reach for his feet a second time, and I miss again. Like, wow, I, I can't believe this happened. What, what's going on? You know? And uh, so then I reach for a third time and I miss again and he walks away. And I was like, we're, we're sort of like that. We have a hard time capturing his mom. We can't capture him, but we can bring him to our hearts. We have a, 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 a dance, a dance with Krishna. That dance, we have to be flexible. We have to be open. We have to be attentive. We have to see which the leads that we get from, from this uh, Krishna that's ours. So, Swami had said also in Nanda Dai, in ending on this, this quote, the, the devotees were there and they said, oh, Swami, you know, you're, you're so giving us so much grace. Uh, what should we do? And uh, they said, Swami said, when grace is overflowing, hold it. When I give you opportunities, what should you do? You should think Swami is showering us so much grace on us. Should we not follow his commands? Should we not get a good name for him? And I think for all of the sevaks and, and officers and people that have sort of dedicated their lives to Swami, it's well worth keeping in mind. Thank you very much for allowing me to be here and share with you. And, and, uh, Jay Sairam.